Amen. Amen. Good to be here. I appreciate you reading that. He found out like five minutes ago he's reading that text, and, <laughs> and that was not necessarily an easy one, so I appreciate that, stepping up and doing that. It's a good, uh, saved me a lot of time. I don't have to read it to you now. How many is familiar with that story? Okay, that's a pretty popular story. Young people probably grew up hearing, hearing that, and uh, uh, I'll tell you this. I'm one of those guys, uh, grew up working with kids, real careful about the words that came out of my mouth. And I was one of those guys, when I came across the word A-S-S in the Bible, I'm like, oh, i got to say donkey, right, because I don't want to offend anybody. And uh, Brother Bo knows this. I said a while back, hey, when I come down here, I, I know what I'm preaching. And I said, but I'm, I'm kind of hesitating. It's so hard for me to do this because the title of my message has got a cuss word in it. <laughs> I know you guys think I'm a little wimp, but I'm just telling you, this is how I grew up. And the title of the message this morning is Dumb Asses and Mad Prophets. And I'm going to explain why. I had to have that title, that, that title, okay, when you understand uh, what I'm talking about. Let me just give you a background. A while back, uh, somebody, good friends of mine, I've got a lot of friends. For those of you that don't know, I went to Heartland. Still love people out there very much. Went to Southwest, uh, Baptist, Temp uh, <laughs> South Southwest Baptist Church out there. And, uh, uh, you know, so I, I have a lot of connections, a lot of friends and, and, and people from different, I guess you can call them different camps of IFB and different people all around and uh, all of a sudden I started seeing guys in the circle posting uh, this video trying to expose Pastor Anderson and they showed a clip of when Pastor Anderson was at Steadfast in Texas and he preached this message saying something about trying to change what it means to be IFB. Anybody remember that video? Yeah. Yeah. Okay and I told the guys because I knew all these guys are going to be watching that video I said Oh, by the way, my name is in that video. Because <laughs> at the end, he starts talking about the potluck 100, and he says, we're changing what it means to have a potluck, right? And he, and he was talking about uh, me in that little section right there. And so all these guys that were railing on him and sharing that video, which really didn't know anything, I said, well, let me just tell you, I said, firsthand experience a little bit about what some of those beliefs are, and I can tell you where I stand since I'm kind of connected with uh, some of those guys and friends with those guys. And and uh, I still, to this day, don't call myself new IFB, but everybody, enemies and friends, put me in that category, right? Because it's just what we share like beliefs and all that stuff. But, uh, but I told a brother this morning, I said, I, I consider myself independent Baptist. If Amen. someone wants to know what I believe, come ask me what I believe, Amen. and we'll, we'll have a conversation from the Bible. And, uh, and so I was having that conversation on Facebook. If you use Facebook, some of you all said uh, have decided not to use Facebook. Amen. Praise the Lord. You made a great decision there, I'm sure. But I use Facebook, and I try to uh, uh, give some of my thoughts and all that stuff on there and maybe do a little preaching. I figure, hey, I only have a handful of people I get to preach to on Sundays and, and, uh, and Wednesdays, and then Thursdays we go out to Kansas City and preach there. But on Facebook, you can have an audience of a 1,000 or whatever. So I said, praise the Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that. And, and so I get on there, and I put some stuff, and, and I put on there, hey, you guys, uh, as politely as I could be, you guys don't know what you're talking about. All the stuff this guy's saying is not really true. And quite honestly, uh, aren't there some things, and I know there are because I've talked to some of these guys, aren't there some things about the quote-unquote IFB that you'd like to change, that you'd like to see change? I mean, I, there's always errors and people going the wrong direction. I said, aren't there things that you want to change? And this guy on there was saying, uh, is a pastor that's kind of uh, influential uh, in some of our circles, and, and he said, every time... I hear that guy preach, and he said a bunch of other negative stuff about him. And then he said, every time I hear that guy preach, I think of 2 Peter 2.16. Go ahead and go there. 2 Peter So obviously this text is talking about false prophets. Verse 15 says, Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bo Boser, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And then th this is the verse he was quoting. But was rebuked by his iniquity, the dumb ass, speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. And when he wrote that, 2 Peter 2.16, I was thinking, well, what is he trying to say there? I don't understand. Who is, because every time I hear that guy preach, I think about this passage. Well, later on, and trying to explain to him what I believe and, and, and try to 
Uh, you know, I made up the, uh, when I uh, became friends with Pastor Anderson, I said, I'm not going to be a, uh, an Anderson apologist, right? I'm not going to try to back him up all the time and try, he can speak for himself, he's, and he's pretty used to adversaries. And so I'm, I'm not going to be a Pastor Anderson apologist, uh, but when I see, he's my friend and my brother, so when I see people saying something that's wrong about him, I wanted to correct him. And so I tried to explain to them some of his beliefs, and his rebuttal was 2 Peter 2.16. And I'm like, I think this guy's calling me a dumb ass. <laughs> I think he's calling Pastor Anderson a dumb ass. I don't think he's calling him a mad prophet, right? And that's the only two people that are in this uh, category here. So, uh, so honestly, that day, this message was in my heart. And I'm like, one day I'm going to preach it. Uh, you know, I think some of the older folks in our church would have a heart attack if I type the message <laughs> dumbasses and mad prophets. But uh, one of these days I'm going to preach it. And I just felt like whenever Brother Shelley asked if I could preach here, I said, well, that's a good time to preach that message. Amen. Okay. Amen. And I'm um, going to tell you what, how the message goes. Uh, it's, it's, it, I told you the background, okay? And in that, by the way, in that video clip that they were showing and spreading around saying, hey, that we got to watch out for this guy. He's a heretic and everything. Here were the things that were the, the IFB was being challenged on. If you really read between the lines and listen to what the message was saying, it was being challenged on the fact that a lot of IFB churches are, have grown super weak in doctrine and super weak in some of the th stands that they take and what they'll stand up against. Uh, and then he brought up some things. Like I said, this is why my name was in it. He was talking about, uh, uh, you know, independent Baptist notoriously have this uh, uh, image of being unhealthy and fat, <laughs> right? I thought about writing a book one day called Healthy and Baptist. I think that would be a good book. Unfortunately, I've spent the last couple years as not necessarily the poster child of good health. <laughs> I'm trying to get back into it right now. But, uh, but it's uh, it, 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 just these simple things that he was challenging on. I didn't see any false doctrine. Now, there's some false doctrine creeping in that needs to be exposed. Uh, we've been, we, I've been having guys hit me up left and right who have fallen into lordship salvation. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to tell them, you know, you are confusing people. I believe that they're saved. Most of the people that I'm talking to, they've just, they've, uh, they've dug down deep on this repent of your sins thing. And, and, and since they can't give a biblical explanation of that in contrast to, hey, it's faith alone. Jesus did the work. Amen. Yeah. And I don't have to do anything. I don't have to necessarily turn from... A life of sin, and anybody that says that's hypocritical because right. there's sins in their life, and and I'm trying to expose this, I'm trying to share these kinds of things, and those are some serious things that we need to take a stand yeah. about, yeah. and and some people to, uh, don't appreciate that, I guess, and and then the soul winning, uh, I've been in Baptist churches my entire life, and every pastor I've ever been under has said, man, I sure wish we can get people to show up for soul winning. I wish we could see more people getting saved. I wish we could knock on doors. I've been in churches that started preaching salvation every message. And I thought, nobody's growing because this is where all the evangelism is taking place, yeah. right at the altar call, mm -hmm. uh, at, the, you know, at the end of service at the altar call. Yeah. Which incidentally doesn't make sense to me because everyone's saying, you know, well, you just believe in easy believism. And when you take guys out and get sold, when you come back and say, hey, five people got saved, they're like, well, you just don't believe that can happen. And yet, those same people preach salvation every Sunday, and whenever somebody comes down to the altar, they say, five people got saved, amen. That was yeah. a good preaching. And I'm thinking, we're taking the same gospel, and we're taking it door to door. I don't understand what your hang-up is, <laughs> okay? But we also believe good, strong preaching, good, strong doctrine needs to uh, take place from behind the pulpit. And so, uh, so I'm just trying to uh, uh, say that, and I got a lot of pushback. Uh, there were guys on my uh, ordination. If you're not familiar with how the uh, quote-unquote old IFB type style, a lot of times ordination, they would just have all the preachers that you, they have some influence in your life, and they're kind of well-known, and you'd get them to come, and they'd be on kind of a council, and they'd interrogate you, ask you all these Bible questions. And uh, so they came to do that. I've only been the pastor there in Iola, by the way, for two years. And so they came. And they said, uh, all right, man, and, and, and I grew up in these circles. I knew these guys for, for many, many years, okay? And so they kind of know me and, and wanted to recommend me, but they wanted to ask me some questions. And, they said, and I asked somebody, uh, one of the guys on the, the panel, if you will, uh, I said, you know, I, I know there's some things that I'm going to say that, that they're, they're not going to agree with. And I said, I just don't know how hard they're going to be on me and that, how... how and, uh, and he said, no, he said, the only thing they're going to ask you about are the things that are in your articles of faith at that church that you're fixing to be the pastor of. 
Why? It just so happened I had taught through the Articles of Faith, and I knew what they said, and I, I agreed with all of them. All right, and so, uh, so they asked me all the questions that came to the, the timing of the rapture, but that's not in our Articles of Faith. The Articles of Faith believe he's, the Lord is coming back. Amen. Anybody, everybody believe the Lord's coming back? Yeah. 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 And he's going to establish a literal 1,000-year reign. Everybody believe in the millennium? Yeah. I believe in that. I believe in everything that was in that Articles of Faith, so when they asked me that, that's what I told them. And then uh, a few months after I became the pastor, somebody said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I see you're friends with Pastor Anderson. Do you not believe pre-trib? And I said, i got to be honest with you, I, I don't. And I know some people are not going to like that about me, but I don't. And I said, I can show you what I believe. I started, I probably for like a half hour, I began to explain what I believe in the Bible. And there was no clear rebuttal to what I just said. There was no like explaining, no, no, my brother, you're wrong. Let me show you this. It was just like, well, I tell you what, if you're not pre-trib, you're going to have to take my name off of your ordination papers. <laughs> I had another guy that wasn't even there said, you ought to resign uh, your ordination. I'm like, I don't even know how you do that. <laughs> Why do I turn back a, you know, I'm, uh, anyway, so, so this, this kind of the, uh, the things that I've been going with, a lot of guys in the, again, circle of independent Baptists, Pretty much said, well, you're you're pretty much just at this point. You're, we, you're still we still love you. You're a friend, but uh, but you're pretty much just now guaranteed. You're never going to preach in any of our churches. Uh, you know, at the camp that we go to, you know, you're not going to have any kind of position, do anything right there. And I'm like, I'm not here to please you. <laughs> I'm not doing it for you. I mean, the church that I'm the pastor of, guess what? They love me. They support me. They back me up. We look at the Bible and see what the Bible says. And I've told them, if you don't agree with me on the timing of the rapture, you know, if you think he's coming three and a half years earlier than I think he's coming, and, it, you know, praise the Lord. And if you're right, praise the Lord. <laughs> I would like not to have to go through any tribulation. But guess what? If you love God, you're going to go through tribulation, right, whether it's right. the great tribulation or not the great tribulation. Like I'm, get, I'm getting off on some things, though. But here's the thing that I thought about when that guy said, 2 Peter 2.16, I said, well, if he's saying that I am representing the dumb ass there, I said, he's the character in the story I actually want to be. Uh, and so this is what we're going to talk about real quick. Look at Jude 1, 11, this parallel passage. And I suspect I've been called that many times. Jude 1, 11. Again, a parallel passage talking about false prophets. It says, Woe unto them, uh, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. And perished in the gainsaying of Korah. And you're probably familiar with that passage there. But so what he's saying, what we know about uh, what we know about Balaam, because if you think about it, if you you probably like me, if you read that passage on your own, growing up with no explanation, you probably thought, well, he's not really a bad guy. Right. I mean, they said, you know, prophesy against us, and he said, I, I against Israel, and he said, I, I can only prophesy what the Lord tells me to prophesy, and that sounds like a really good thing. But then when you read that he's exposed as a false prophet, you see that there was this love for reward, and there was this desire. And, of course, even when you read the story, you can see he's, he's wanting to do it. He's wanting to get the pay. He's wanting to get the... It's just he knows that God's not going to let him. And so, uh, but he has that desire. And if you read between the lines, uh, that's not the point of the message to, uh, this morning, but if you read between the lines, it appears like he actually did find a way to finagle around God's word. Right. And even though he couldn't curse them like he wanted to, he was able to plant a seed where they were able to get sin into the children of Israel. Okay, but, uh, but anyway, in the story, the dumb ass is the character that I want to be. And uh, uh, let me just first give you just a little bit from kind of the perspective of the mad prophet, and then we'll take a look at the uh, donkey, if you will. All right, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and the, and the weak things of this world to confound that which, uh, those which are mighty. I think I messed that up a little bit. But. And so you can understand, number one, God is going to use something that as a whole, the, the world would say that, that's not very influential. That's not very significant. That's, that, that person doesn't have any power. And God wants to use them. Why? So he can get the glory. Right? And so he's willing to do that. And, uh, and it seems like uh, the, the Balaam type people out there, 
uh, are mad in more than one ways, okay? Now, the Bible uh, talks about him, this uh, prophet being mad when you read uh, 2 Peter. And in the Bible, uh, sometimes the word mad just means like out of their mind. Uh, I think of David, you know, whenever he, he, po- he pretended to be mad. And it looked like he was foaming at the mouth and he was acting weird. And he said, this guy's mad, like he's out of his mind, right? And, uh, uh, you know, I wonder about Balaam if he was a little cuckoo too, because I think it's weird the donkey starts talking. He just acts like it's just a normal thing. <laughs> so maybe he was already hearing voices. I don't know. But, but that's not what it means when it says mad. I, I believe, uh, actually, by the way, a prophet can and I think should be mad about some things, right? Being mad uh, as far as being angry or having indignation uh, is not bad. The Bible says, be angry and sin not in Ephesians 4.28. Look at Exodus 32. Exodus 32. I love this story because you see Moses being gentle and being an intercessor and merciful and saying, God, don't destroy these people. You love these people. You've, done, you've already made a promise to these people, and he's being all nice to them. But after all, they did worship a golden calf while Moses is up there getting commandments saying, don't have any other gods and don't make any graven images. And so this was a bad thing. And then when you get to Exodus 32, look at verse 17. This is that same Moses that said, oh, God, please don't, don't, uh, don't you know, have mercy on them. Don't destroy them. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise noise of war in the camp. And he said, It's not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that are singing contemporary Christian music. No, I mean, uh, (laughs) them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he, came, that he uh, saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' Moses's anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands, and he brake them beneath the mount, and he took the calf which they had made, and burned it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and strawed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. I'm telling you, I'm a pretty nice guy. <laughs> when I read stories like that, I'm like, man, I would never be, I would never crush something into powder and say, drink this, right? <laughs> Moses got angry, yeah. and it's okay. Yeah. He had a right to be angry. Yeah. It was a righteous indignation. It's not wrong for prophets to be angry. Look at Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, this is uh, Jesus, and no, it's not the turning of the tables, but uh, another story. He, he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which, wa- which had a withered hand. And they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he said unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day, or to do evil? To save life or to kill, but they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. You see, Jesus was mad because these guys didn't even care that this guy be healed. Didn't even care that, you know, a good thing was done. All they cared about is, hey, who's this guy that thinks he can just break the Sabbath? Never mind, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. They didn't understand that. But he said, he looked at the hardness of their heart, and it says he was moved with anger, you know, at the hardness of their heart. They don't care that somebody's healed. They don't care about these people. Uh, they just wanted to, uh, to put Jesus' work to stop, okay? And, uh, but so here's what we're, that's the kind of we're talking about. Luke 6, 11, the Pharisees, and they were filled with madness, okay? That's not talking about their drooling and and you know not thinking straight or whatever they're filled with madness and commune one another with uh commune one with the other what uh what they might do to jesus all right so you're talking about they're mad they're out of their mind mad upset why because this jesus had to be stopped and what are some of the things that they hated jesus for i mean never mind the fact they hate god and so they you know he's he's doing that standing for that which is holy so they're going to hate that but there were some specific things that they were mad at him for. 
he was drawing people uh, uh, to the Lord, and they were leaving some of the things that they were teaching, which was getting them, you know, they were afraid they're going to lose their position, you know, and their, their high standing in the community and among the influential people and the, and the rulers and all that. They were afraid they were going to lose that. And so they're mad at this guy who's like still uh, claiming to come up out of the Jews and to, and to be of a Jewish descent. And he's leading all these people and he's claiming to be the Messiah. And they're mad because it's messing with their position, right? And they're upset about that. And, uh, and they don't like the fact that he's got gaining popularity and things are happening. Well, is, in our story there in Numbers 22, isn't that exactly what is going on? Look at that again in Numbers 22. So Balak and the Moabites, they're worried about, about these people, these, the, the godly remnant here, the godly people. They're worried about them, and uh, 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 the Moabites are, up, are worried because they're seeing these guys are covering the face of the earth. Okay, look at verse 5. Uh, and he sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Beor, and uh, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from uh, Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. He's like, we need to stop this. We need to put a curse upon these people. They're growing. They're influential. They're, 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 they're cramping my style. <laughs> they're messing me up, you know. Uh, and they had to get rid of them. And this is the kind of thing that makes people like that mad. And so you got the Moabites. Who are wicked people? I mean, come on. Uh, and the Moabites are wicked, and they're looking at the Israelites, God's people, is, is what the picture is clearly representing. And they're looking at God's people, and they're saying, we got to do something to stop these guys. They're, they're you know, uh, they're, they're messing us up. But the, ba- the, uh, the Balaams of this world, right? The Balaams of this world are like, hey, I don't really care. I just want my money. Yeah. I just want my recognition. I just right. want the power. And so... They're doing what they can to please the Moabites, yep. right? Uh, anything it takes. If it means stopping these godly people and they will side with the wicked to stop the godly people, they'll do it yep. if there's a reward involved. And so this is what makes them mad when they see somebody standing up and saying, hey, I might not be an influential person. I might not mean much to anybody, but I am going to use my voice to stand up and say, this is wrong. We need not to go this way. We need Amen. to follow the Lord and do what's right. And, uh, and actually, Balaam was not the one that did that. People like Balaam, they get upset whenever a person like, I'm fixing to describe, like the dumb ass in the story, uh, rises up against them. And they get really upset. So let's talk about the perspective now of the dumb ass. Look at verse 30 of our text. Verse 30. And the ass said unto Balaam, Art not I thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. You know what I learned about the donkey here is that this donkey was a faithful servant for many, many years. He obeyed his master, did what his master said, go this way. He went that way. His master says, stop. He stopped. He obeyed his master for many, many years. And uh, and it was only this one time that he was actually saw something in the way that his master didn't see. And he said, I've got to go off to the side. And the master got mad. Why are you going that way? I want to go this way. He started beating him. (laughs) All right. And he's like, have I ever done this, done you wrong before? Why why aren't you wondering why I'm, I'm going this opposite direction? And I think about that with these guys. Uh, again, I love them. I've uh, been, I, grow, I, I grew up independent Baptist, right? I, I have a lot of appreciation and, and, and thankfulness to those guys who have served. And, and I try to serve faithfully. I went to uh, uh, Southwest here, submitted myself. I was involved in the bus ministry and, and did all, you know, tried to help out wherever I could. Wherever I could. Uh, I came before that. I came out of a, a, a church. Uh, my dad retired in Kansas from the military, 
and we were going to a church right there, and this is whenever I first said, I, I think I want to preach. I think the Lord called me to, uh, to preach, and I want to go see. At that time, they didn't know what else to do except send you off to Bible college. And this was before Heartland was even here, and they sent me to BBC in Springfield. Anybody know anything about BBC in Springfield? And uh, they said, well, you know, we're not in agreement with everything they teach there, but we've got to send you somewhere, so we'll send you down to BBC. So I went to BBC. Why? Because that's what my preacher told me to do. Amen. And so I went to BBC, and I preacher... I knew, always taught, hey, we're King James only. So when I heard professors at BBC saying, well, you know, the King James isn't the best version, right? And even though they weren't supposed to be saying that because in, their, in the, the literature they handed out, it said they were King James only. But the professors were saying they're not King James only. And I said, I don't like this, right? I've been taught better than this. And so I, you know, went against that. And eventually I stopped going to school there. They were also teaching Calvinism at that time and some different things. And I was like, I, I don't want any part of that. And so I left. Heartland opened up, and all these guys that I grew up uh, under and submitted myself to said, this is the college. Man, you need to go to this college. I went to the college. I never did graduate either one, by the way, but I did go. <laughs> I got plugged into the church there. I got involved. Uh, then somebody uh, at one of our sending churches, long story short, but I guess kind of the church that uh, uh, where our family was who had sent us to college. Uh, I'm not going to give all the background on that, but... Uh, they had said, hey, we, you know, we could really use somebody right now working with the youth. I prayed about it. I felt like the Lord opened up that door and said, you know, I think I'll go there. And I'll be the youth pastor. And I, so I served uh, actually with my father-in-law, who was the pastor there. And I served uh, seven years, right, to marry his daughter-in-law. Daughter <laughs> to marry his daughter, I had to work seven years for my father-in-law. Right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. And so uh, seven years, actually about eight years as the youth pastor there and assistant pastor before I became the pastor there. It's not like I just was this hothead that said, you know what, I don't like the way that people are doing things. I want to just change everything. Right. It wasn't like that. I tried to be faithful. I tried to, and, and this would be my encouragement to anybody who wants to serve the Lord with their life, wants to be maybe full-time ministry sometime, someday, uh, sometime. Number one, one of the things you have to do is you have to realize I've got to prove myself. I mean, even the office of the deacon, the Bible says that he's got to first prove himself, Amen. right? Yeah. I've got to prove myself. I've got to be faithful. I've got to realize that I'm not going to necessarily agree with everything that's being done, everything that's being said, but I want to be there, and I want to be a blessing. I want to be a help. Amen. And God's going to use guys like that. He uses them all throughout the Bible. In this case, he uses even a dumb ass, right? Yeah. And he's just being a faithful servant, and then God opens up his mouth, and he speaks. Okay, so the first thing about the uh, dumbass is that he was submissive, submissive, not just, you know, all this time, but, but even during this time, he was submissive. He just said this one thing, I can't run you into this angel who's got a sword out, right? I want to steer you from, <laughs> that was the case. And so he, one time, he, he goes against him, and he starts getting beat, right? Look, we need to be submissive, but only up to a point. Right? There are some things where you've got to say, no, no, no I, can't, I can't allow this to, to, to continue. I can't be involved in this. Amen. Right? Amen. Yeah. Or when you actually have a voice and it's your opportunity, you've served your time, so to speak, and now you have a chance to say something. You can't be afraid and say, well, I'm going to lose friends if I say this. You have to Amen. say, look, right. have I ever done you wrong? I've, I've served you. I've, I've done my best to learn under you and to study the Bible. And now I'm seeing something. I'm saying there's some dangers that's going on, and we need to put a, a warning against that. And I'm not going to lead the people that I'm pastoring down that road. Amen. Amen. So I start going off to the side, and they say, well, how dare you? You'll never be... You know, <laughs> You never show your face in this town again. <laughs> You'll never be uh, preaching in our, from our pulpits. Okay, I won't. I'll go preach it steadfast. No <laughs> <laughs> and actually, the Lord allowed uh, me to meet a bunch of guys. Each one of them had this testimony. I guess I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying this to praise uh, Pastor Anderson, but I realize there's probably a lot of guys in here that kind of started the started. Uh, kind of going to church or whatever or getting involved in church, soul winning, stuff like that because they had watched maybe some videos or some preaching from Pastor Anderson and, and, uh, and I got to meet a bunch of these guys and as I realized, hey, I've been taught my whole life that we need to be soul winning, we need to be winning people to the Lord and I said, and I, ha I just haven't, it's one of those situations and I find myself, uh, it can be real easy to start preaching and saying, hey, you got to get out there and you got to win souls and then you don't give them any opportunity or show them how to do it or give them a soul-winning time or something like that. And I realized 
we're messed up on this. We need to actually provide times and we need to go out and preachers ought to set an example and actually go out with the, with the guys that are still winning. And, and as soon as I had the burden for that, and uh, when I became the pastor, I mean, we would see, I remember one quarter, I said, praise the Lord, uh, each quarter we kind of give a little report to the church and a bit, uh, kind of a business meeting. And this quarter I said, hey, we saw like three people, two, two or three people get saved this quarter. Praise the Lord. And I said, but i got to be honest with you, man, I'm, I, I'm actually ashamed of that. I think we could be doing that every week. Yeah. And to these guys, we're talking about 20 people, you know, 70s, 80s. I even have some 90-year-olds in the congregation. Uh, primarily ladies, just only a couple guys. That's all we got left. A lot of people left our church, and that's a long story. But uh, and, and this is all we have left. And I'm saying, I'm telling these people, and I felt kind of like Gideon, right? <laughs> Getting ready to face this army, and he has this great vision, but he's got just 300 soldiers, right? And I felt like God has already weeded out all these people, and this is what's left. And I'm and I'm telling them, hey, we, I want to see four people a week getting saved. And at that time, I'm in Iola, and I don't have any soul winners, and I'm thinking we're going to have to really step it up. And I'm saying, everybody needs to pray for laborers. We need to pray for laborers. Then I just started meeting people left and right who were soul winners. Unfortunately, they lived an hour and a half away, but they <laughs> were soul winners. And so I was driving up there, or they were driving down to Iola, and we were going out, we were knocking doors, we were seeing people saved. And uh, through uh, uh, just some different events, uh, and particularly the mega marathon last year, which, you know, I, I know we're getting ready to do that again, we kind of began this little group where we were going soul winning. And I said, look, I'm not trying to steal anybody's sheep or take anybody out of a church. Some of them were already going to a church, and they liked it, but they weren't exactly on the same page. But these guys said, man, if you were a little bit closer, we would love to just be part of there. And I said, well, let's pray about this. Let's not jump the gun, all right? If it's a year from now, whatever it takes, let's be patient. But, but I said, let's start a work up in Kansas City where we're just, it's like a mission out of Iola Baptist Temple where our goal is to knock on every door of the Kansas City metro, two million people, something like that, and we'll just knock on every door. Uh, we'll give them a place to go and to, and to learn and to grow, uh, baptize and disciple believers and everything, but, but our primarily goal is, of planning that work out there is just a mission work, to see souls saved. And next thing you know, we are seeing, oh, I mean, we are going out hitting door, like thousands of doors every month. And, and we're not, uh, maybe not thousands every month, but uh, going through boxes of, of just like crazy of invites. And I said, hey, this is great, man. We're not just passing out invites either, knocking on doors and giving them the gospel. Lots of souls are getting saved. And, of course, you got those that are saying, I don't believe that many people can get saved. Mm -hmm. Even though you got eight groups of people and they're going out for like, you know, two hours now, stop, have lunch, go out another two hours, and they're saying, look at all these people who got saved. And you got others saying, I don't think that's happening. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's happening. And then all of a sudden, one day, I came back to the church, uh, another quarterly meeting, and I said, it is unbelievable what God's done in, like, the last five months. We've been praying for laborers. He sent us laborers. They might be up in Kansas City, but we're now seeing way more than four people a, a week saved on an average. And I'm just like, praise the Lord for that. We're getting something done. You think I want to be stopped by somebody who, you know, just wants to beat me because he doesn't think I'm being, uh, I'm lining up exactly with him or doing exactly what he wants to do? Beat me all you want. <laughs> you know? Kick me, out of your, kick me out of your camp. Don't let me come to your pulpit. Whatever. I, I, I'm not trying to be a troublemaker. I'm just trying to serve the Lord. Amen. And I would love to even help you and assist you. Right? I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about these, these guys who would, who would uh, be naysayers. So we need to be submissive to a point, but there's a time where we've got to stand and, uh, and, and just see what's coming ahead and say, I'm not going to lead my people down that way. These are the guys God's given me to lead. I'm not going to lead them that way. And here's what happens whenever he does that. Look at verse 25. Verse 25, And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself unto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot. You ever heard someone say they got their foot stepped on? <laughs> Sometimes we step on people's feet, yeah, yeah, and they don't like it. He got his foot against the wall, and he smote her again. Sometimes, when we're, and again, we got to do it right. We've got to be submissive. We've got to spend our time serving, not trying to be troublemakers, not causing problems. But then, when we have our time, we have our opportunity. We need to stand up and say, "Hey, I'm going to stand for what's right, whether you like it or don't Amen. like it." Yeah. And they're going to say, "Hey." That hurts me. Yeah. I'm sorry. Would you rather get slain by the angel? Right. Right. 
Because here's the final step of this, is that one day God will reveal the truth. And I'm not talking about just when we get to heaven. I'm talking about one day, it, it always happens. It unfolds, and they say, you know what? He was right. I mean, if a guy's, if a guy's preaching truth and doing right, it'll, it'll be found out Amen. in the end. Now, if I'm wrong, yeah. I, hope it, I hope I find out real quick, and Amen. I'm exposed wrong. But whoever's right, it gets found out in the end. And in this case, uh, the, ba- uh, uh, the donkey talks. Uh, Balaam's hitting them, and the, the, the donkey says, hey, why are you hitting me? And then the next thing you know, uh, Balaam sees the angel and has a little conversation. Now, I lost where I was in my notes, but that's okay. Uh, okay, here's, here's one thing I wanted to share. Uh, look at 2 Timothy 4.2. Or let me just read it to you. You're, you're probably familiar with it. 2 Timothy 4.2. Be instant in season, out of season. Uh, reprove, rebuke. And exhort with all long suffering, and suffering and doctrine. That's what we're called to do, uh, as preachers. I'm not saying everybody. Uh, I don't think I don't believe everybody should try to rise up and try to be in a position of leadership and authority. And and you know, there's too much of that, really. Too many Amen. people just want to. I, I, want, I want to make my decision. I want to tell people what I think. And I want to. And uh, actually, James kind of talks about that and says, "Hey, you know, does, I, I'm messing it up." But it says. Oh, it says, be not many masters, Amen. right? Yeah. And I think this idea of people just wanting to get out there and, and let me make a video and expose this. Let me make a video and, and, and criticize this person, rebuke this person. And at some point, it's like, man, you don't know what kind of problems you're causing by doing that. Don't do it unless God called you to do it. Amen. But when you have the opportunity and you stand up and you're going to stand for truth, uh, God's going to bless that and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, be instant in season. It says, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering, and doctrine. So we need to be servants while we're young, while we're learning, while we're growing. God's got a plan. He knows what he's doing. Uh, But whenever we have an opportunity to stand for truth, we need to stand for truth. Look at verse 31. By the way, I was thinking about this. uh, even, Even Paul... Paul comes before Peter. I mean, Peter's like the leader of the church, not the Pope, but he's the lead, <laughs> leader of the church kind of there in Jerusalem. And he's leading the people, and, uh, and Paul's submitting to him. He says, hey, we're going to send you out. Paul goes out and all that stuff. But then there's a certain time, we won't go there right now, there's a certain time where, where Paul has to rebuke Peter to his face. Yeah. Say, what you're doing is wrong. He say, oh, that little punk. You know, Paul, what's he doing going up against there? Well, he was standing for right. Amen. Amen. And he was saying, what you're doing is wrong and it's wicked. And I see the hypocrisy and I see all that. And he's standing against that and he was doing right. I kind of feel like God blessed Paul's ministry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, he, I think he was doing what was right. Look at verse 31 now. God will reveal the truth in the end. And the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before uh, before me. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. I think about these guys who are going out winning souls, and I think, you know what? If it wasn't for guys going out winning souls, I think some of these uh, uh, older IFB type churches, God would just say, "Hey, I'm taking, I'm removing your candlestick. I'm just, I'm just putting you out, right?" But thankfully, some guys, uh, there's like a new generation of guys. It seems like who are saying, "Man, we got to stand for the King James. We got to stand for the preaching of the gospel. We got to go out there and we got to do the work, and we got to, we got to do what God's called us to do." And God's like, "Hey." You know, if it wasn't for these guys, I'd sm- I, you'd be dead. <laughs> All right? I don't want anyone to, I don't want, okay, notice, you know, Balaam sees the angel of the Lord and he bows down, right? I'm not asking anyone to bow down to me and say, oh, you were right all this time. <laughs> you know, that's, 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 a, that's heresy, right? I'm not saying, I remember watching this guy say uh, he was a hardcore dispensationalist and Ruckman and all that kind of stuff, and uh, you probably know who I'm talking about. I probably saw the video clip, but this guy literally preached. One day, all are going to stand before the Lord. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. And he's like, they're going to bow before Peter Ruckman and say, you were right. 
And I'm like, that's blasphemy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> We're all going to bow before the Lord. I'm not going right. to get any credit because Amen. I was right and somebody else was wrong. Right. Guess what? I'm gonna, a lot's going to be revealed where I was wrong, I guarantee right. you. Amen. I just want us to glorify God. I want to do yeah. what's right for God. Amen. I want to be just a simple, dumb ass. Amen. All right? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and the uh, inspiration we can receive from the, from the inspired word of God. And we thank you, Lord. Pray you use it. Uh, help us, Lord, to be faithful, uh, to be uh, useful for you in this world. And help us stand up for what's right. But help us also not just be uh, loud mouths and stubborn and and uh, troublemakers help us to uh, uh, just our our burden and our desire would be that we accomplish the work you've called us to do and that souls get saved and that people learn the truth from the Bible Lord help us know when we're wrong lead us uh, guide us and direct us that your name would be glorified and the work would be done Lord in these last days in Jesus name I pray Amen. Amen.